time to Shannon Levin, your friendly librarian, and I am back with some book love. So let's chat. I finished several books this week, and actually I finished a lot of books in June. It was a really good month for me. One that I'm super excited to talk to you about is this big thing, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. I showed you a video of when this book came in the mail. I ordered it after the whole COVID thing started from an independent bookstore in Cincinnati. I believe I ordered this one from Blue Manatee. So I've had it for a long time, but once it got here and I saw how big it was, Ooh, that's a little bit daunting. You know, I like to start and finish my books like within a week. And when this one came, some people were already reviewing it online and it, it didn't look good. Like the reviews were not favorable. And everybody knows we've been waiting for this forever. The author who did Hunger Games, Catching Fire and Mockingjay. And then she told us that she was gonna come out with this, which is basically a prequel, but it's not your regular prequel because we're not talking about the same characters. We're not talking about Katniss in this. We're actually focusing on a very unpopular character from the series, Snow. In the book, 18 year old Coriolana Snow, and I'm just gonna call him Snow from here on out because Coriolanus is very hard to say, especially whenever I'm speaking so fast. But in this book, he is in the capital. He's from the capital. He lives in the capital. He's one of the mentors for those that are competing in the Hunger Games. We're talking about the 10th annual Hunger Games in this particular book. So it's quite a bit before we meet Katniss. Snow's family has been very prominent in years past, but everyone has been affected by how the capital has restructured things, including Snow's family. So they've fallen on hard times and there's Snow and his grandmother and a cousin. We find out a lot about what has made Snow Snow from the Snow that we know in the later books. Snow gets the tribute from District 12, the girl, and he needs her to win. The person who wins gets lots of, not only lots of notoriety, but they also get scholarships to go to college and there is no money in Snow's family, so he needs that money. Now we're talking about a very young Snow. He's 18 years old. He is not jaded like we see him in the regular Hunger Games. He's not the evil that we see in the regular Hunger Games books. It is an 18 year old Snow who's just trying to make his way to university. One thing I really like is when authors put quotes in the beginning of their book and they just, when you're reading them, you can tell that this is what the themes of the book are gonna carry. So in this particular one, she quotes Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, which is obviously interesting, John Locke's The Second Treatise of Government, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, The Social Contract, William Wordsworth, The Table's Turn, Lyric Ballads, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So this book came out in May. And even though it looks daunting, because it is, it's long. It really did not feel like that to me. Once I really started getting into it, um, there are 517 pages, and I just, I could not wait to sit down every day and read this book. Sometimes, especially during, you know, the whole COVID and dark times like that, I think it's hard for me to read dark books. So it's another reason why I put it off. But to me, this is not a dark book. I know it sounds like it should be because it's about snow and snow is a terrible person. The snow that we know now is a terrible person. But the book, even though it's even about the Hunger Games, it just doesn't appear dark. It's not something that I dreaded to sit down to. I wanted to take the time to sit down and read this book. I wrote a very lengthy Goodreads review, so you might want to check out my review. Now, back when The Hunger Games came out, we were all taken with it. Hunger Games and Catching Fire and Mockingjay. We read the books, we watched the movies, but to be honest, I was not a super fan. Like, I liked the books and I liked the movies, but I only read them one time and I only went to, to the movie theater and saw them one time. When they replay on TV and I see that they're on, I'm like, eh, I don't really need to watch it again, I'm good. I know there was a lot of talk, again, I'm a high school librarian, so there was a lot of talk when the third book came out that people were really disappointed. So the first Hunger Games, you have the Hunger Games, right? So we find out what they are, we meet Katniss and the other competitors, and then in the second one, all of the people who have won the previous Hunger Games come back and they're all fighting against each other. So you get basically a Hunger Games redo. But then in the third one, there's a revolution. So Katniss changes. She's a different person. She's leading the revolution, but she has a family. You know, she has a spouse. Like things are different. And people, when it jumped forward, people were like, she's not being true to the Katniss that we've been seeing in these other two books. But be honest, that's the growth of a character. And when Suzanne Collins showed that when she was writing the three Hunger Games books, that is definitely a skill that she brings back in this. She is building a character and she's building a character that you already know who he's gonna turn out to be, but he doesn't. He is struggling with who he is. 
So there are many great characters in this book. Not only Snow, who we get an in-depth look at, but his cousin is a big character in here. And again, he does have people in his life who love and care about him. We meet Sejanus, who is a classmate of Snow, and also another one of the mentors for another district. Sejanus really is struggling. He is struggling with what the Hunger Games is, what they're being asked to do, the treatment of the tributes. I think that's something that really comes out in this is that, especially at this point, even Snow is like, this is a terrible thing. These Hunger Games, what's the point? Why are we doing this? What's the purpose? What's supposed to be coming out of this? And he asks those questions, but Sejanus, his classmate, just can't handle it. He can't handle the answers. He's not buying into the Hunger Games. He's not as desperate as Snow is. And then of course we meet Lucy Gray, an amazing character that we will remember as we remember Katniss. She is the District 12 girl tribute and she has spunk. She's unique and we find out where she gets her name. She writes the backstory. She doesn't just arbitrarily give people names even though they're weird like Sejanus and Coriolanus. You know, those are weird names, but Lucy Gray, her name, we find out where it comes from and it's just a beautiful story. Obviously, this is a book of survival. Not only the tributes trying to survive, but the mentors are trying to survive. It's a terrible, the Capitol and the Hunger Games, they are terrible places and things. They are terrible events. The Hunger Games started in 2008. So we are talking, we are 10, over 10 years past when we were first introduced to the Hunger Games. So if you have not reread or watched the movies or rewatched the movies, you might have a hard time picking up some of the things, but quite frankly, I think you could pick up this book and never have read or watched the Hunger Games and be interested in it because it is good writing. It's good character development. Now I do think that after you finish this, you would want to continue reading the Hunger Games and you know, that's not a bad thing. When the reviews were coming out, people were talking about how J.K. Rowling did the Harry Potter series and then later she did The Cursed Child. So not only did she change the Harry Potter format and being no um, novels and she changed it to The Cursed Child as a play, but she also just wrote a different kind of, of book. It wasn't like the next book in the series. It's an extension of the series. And I also think that's how we should view The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. It's an extension. Yes, it comes before. It is a prequel to The Hunger Games, but it's definitely an extension of the story. So it goes in depth. She takes her time. She knows she has fans who will read whatever it is that she writes. Even if we don't care for the character that she's writing about, we're going to read it. It is a type of villain origin story. So if you know you talk about like Marvel comics and they do the villain origin stories, yes, yeah, Snow is a villain. This is definitely his origin. You get an in-depth background. So it's written for the fans. Snow gets really attached, very close and really attached to the District 12 tribute that he is assigned to. Now he's in charge of getting her food, getting her sponsors, and all of this is new. They're just figuring out how the, how the Hunger Games work. We do find out where some of the things in the Hunger Game, like who made them up or who brought them to be, some of the backstory, and that's really cool. There are three parts to this book. There is the mentor, the prize, and the peacekeeper. And it spans quite a long time, and it also tells a very different story. So the whole book is not the Hunger Games. The part, part of the book is setting it up, part of the book is the Hunger Games, and part of the book is what comes after. This is a strong story about choices and how we become who we are. It's a look into survival and power and what power does to people. Lucy Gray is named from a Wordsworth poem. And if you go back and you read the poem, you would wonder, especially before you read the book, is it her fate? Is it her future? Will this be her future? Is it a self-fulfilling prophecy for Lucy? Or will it prove that the odds are in her favor? Snow's relationship with Sejanus does give us a first look into how cold he can be. I hesitate to call Sejanus his friend. He's a classmate. Sejanus definitely thinks that Snow is his friend, but Snow shows his true colors. Collins includes songs, ballads, poems, and a lot of culture into the Panem world. So let's talk about what some reviewers say they don't like about the book. They don't like the pacing. They think it was too slow. I disagree. I think that it's a different kind of book. If you are picking this up, thinking that you're reading about a whole nother Hunger Games, yes, there's a Hunger Games story in here, but it's definitely not the purpose for her writing this book. So the pacing to me was fine. Like I said, I wanted to sit down and read this every minute I got. Another complaint is of all the characters in the Hunger Games stories, why did you pick Snow? We all hate Snow. Why talk to us about Snow? But again, I think it is because Collins wants to talk to you about the evolution of a character. 
Now, as you're reading this, you are going to realize that it is a timely time to read this book when we are talking about the government's involvement in our lives. More things have been mandated in the last few months than have ever, I feel like, been mandated to us. When you can go out, what you're allowed to do when you go out, what you should be wearing when you go out, how you should be talking about the greater good of society. All these things are timely. So, you know, do I think that we're living in the Hunger Games time or under capital? No, I do not. But I do think that it brings up some of those themes and it helps us get a, a little bit different perspective. It definitely puts a spotlight on some of the things that we are going through now. Collins doesn't follow the rules on this book. That is for sure. She derails. She goes in depth in things that maybe you might not even care about. You might not even think about, but she has earned that right. She wrote three blockbuster books. I enjoyed it. I enjoy, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm glad she wrote it. I think it adds to the series. Unlike in the Harry Potter, the cursed child, when it left you with this like bad taste in your mouth, cause these people do not appear to be happy. It, ew, I was not a big fan of that one. I could have done without reading the cursed child. This one I think really adds to the series for me. I highly recommend the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. So of course I'm always interested whenever books get turned into movies, then where I can rewatch those. And I did look to see if I could watch the Hunger Games movies before I read this book to kind of refresh my memory. But the only place that I could find them was on Amazon and you had to pay for them. They're not on Amazon Prime for free. You have to actually pay to rent them or purchase them. So um, I do like to just pass on that information to you. But if you have free form, I only have like 10 channels on Spectrum. Uh, and then we watch Netflix and Acorn and BritBox and whatever, uh, Amazon Prime. But if you do have free form, then they are going to play the Hunger Games movies on July 11th. So mark it on your calendar. So another book that I've had on my to be read list for a long time and I finally got to is I'd Rather Be Reading The Delights and Dilemmas of the Reading Life by Ann Bogle. She is the creator of the website Modern Miss Darcy. I picked up this book at Cincinnati's Books by the Banks, which I have sang the praises to on many of my videos, but it comes in the fall every year. It is a free book festival down in Cincinnati at the Duke Energy Center. And I met her this past year and I picked up her book. It's a really short one. And you know I'm a librarian, so I love to look at these things. If you look at the classification, this is about the subjects of books and reading. And really, it's just a love letter to reading and to reader. I do always like to show you if I've got a nice signed copy there, because I always think that's cool. I enjoy meeting the authors, especially at Books by the Banks. You're right up close to them. She also puts those quotes in the beginning. It gives you an insight to what the book is going to be about. All How Good It Is to Be Among People Who Are Reading by Rainer Maria Rilke. Beautiful book. I, I do think it's beautiful. Um, if you look on Goodreads, you might be a little confused because I do only rate it three out of five stars. I lost interest. They're essays on reading and they are very personal to her. There are many things that I like, such as I like when people are writing about books or reading and they, they drop the titles in there and there is some writing around the particular titles that they're mentioning. Each of these little essays could stand on their own. So, you know, I think if I were reading it over a long period of time and I just read like a chapter at a time, like before I went to bed or sat down or maybe in the morning, I probably would have enjoyed it more, but I had just been trying to get through it for so long that I finally was just like, I'm sitting down and finishing it. So maybe that it's not that kind of book. So those three stars are probably my fault. Vogel also has a podcast, which I haven't listened to yet. So I need to pick that up and take a look but I have followed her website for many years. It's actually how I got to know that she had the book out. If you are a book lover, definitely check out her website, her blog, and I plan to check out her podcast. The other thing that I really like, again, that librarian coming out in me, but in the back, there is a works referenced. So I do love a good book list. And like I said, because she has dropped them in throughout the whole book, I always enjoy whenever I get to the end, I can go back and read over the list of the books that have been mentioned in the book. So I would definitely recommend it. I'm just saying, take your time. Don't rush through it. It's, it's a book of essays about the love of reading and book lovers. So the next two books that I read, I read because I was approved by NetGalley. I think I may have talked to you about it in the last video. And I was instantly improved for Riley Sager's Home Before Dark. I had been meaning to read some Riley Sager. And actually after I got it and I looked, I'm like, wait a minute, I felt like I might have read something by him before. And I had, I read the last time I lied back in like January or February. I really, really enjoyed it. It's a thriller, it's a mystery, it's suspense, it's a horror story, all balled into one. I really enjoyed it. So I would highly recommend if you're looking for a good thriller, good page turner, 
I read it in a day. I didn't mean to read it in a day, but I was trying to get some other stuff done. So I would sit down and read a chapter and then get some work done and then sit down and read a chapter. And I was home all day, so it, I got it all done. I stayed up late and I got up early, but I really enjoyed it and I was able to wipe it out in a day. This book just came out in June. So by the time I filled out my application and the book came to me, I didn't have a lot of time to read it before it was already published. You might say that this falls under the genre of unreliable narrator because as the main character is telling us her story, Maggie, she's not sure she can trust herself. This is the story of her growing up and only they were only there for, I think, four weeks in a haunted house. So what happened was they move into this house. They're going to redo it, renovate some things, um, but the realtor did not tell them what the house's history was. So they find out that people think this house is haunted. Several tragedies have happened in this house. So her her family ends up leaving. They like flee in the middle of the night and her dad writes a tell-all memoir. But when she reads the book, it's not exactly what she remembers. So she thinks that her parents have lied about this just to make money off of this house. So when her dad passes away and she goes to find out the reading of the will, she finds out that he still owns this house. She thought they got rid of the house a long time ago. You know, she's like 20 something, I think. And so, and it was, she was young, like, you know, four years old or something, whenever she lived in the house. And she was only there for about four weeks before they fled in the middle of the night. But she finds out that she owns this house now. So even though her dad tells her never to return, her mom tells her never to return, she goes back. She's now a house renovator, decorator. So she's going to go back, fix it up and sell it for a profit. So she moves back into the house. And at the same time, she's trying to dig in and find out if what her dad wrote was true. She knows that some of it is based in truth. So while she's there, she's asking people, she's looking in the house for memories. No one's lived there since they've lived there. It's not like he, you know, somebody lived there. The house is just like they left it the night they left. So I really do wanna thank NetGalley for letting me read this. This is a modern haunted house story reminiscent of The Haunting of Hill House or The Amityville Horror. If those are stories that you read or watched and liked, you're going to like this book. It's a chilling tale. One of the other things that I really liked about this book is when I thought I had it all figured out, I didn't have anything figured out. It was a surprise ending. Another element in the book that you don't see real often is even though you know that Maggie has a hard time with her parents as she's growing up because this book is... She is known for this book. When people meet her, they're like, oh, you're the girl who lived in the haunted house. How was it? How was it to live in that? What did it feel like to grow up there? So this is hung over her as she has grown up, but she doesn't really, she's upset with her parents that this has happened, that she's been put in this position. But then some things come to light that maybe her dad is not as innocent as she wants him to be. And I liked that thread that was going through the book because you're uncomfortable but you're just not sure. I mean, the guy the guy just passed away. Like, you don't want to accuse him of things that he can't even answer to. There's something about the time element in the book, the fact that Maggie only lived there for four weeks when she was younger, and then she's moving back basically in the summertime, and she's only going to be there for a short time before she's going to try and flip it and sell the house. There's something about that time element that made it, like, unput downable like I just wanted to read because I knew she wasn't going to last long in that house I wanted to find out what was going to happen it was a true suspense Sager does a good job of helping you relate to Maggie because just as Maggie doubts the story you doubt the story is it a haunted house I mean I think we're feeling like we're reading a haunted house story but maybe it's not a haunted house because these things probably have some sort of explanation but when things start happening in the house and the doors are locked, the windows are locked, how else can you explain this? So every night at the end of the day, Maggie locks the doors, she locks the windows, she sets things that would show if the windows of the doors get opened, yet Maggie still has company when the lights go out. Okay, I'm not one to usually include trigger warnings. That's really more of a recent thing and I feel like it's part of the development of a story. But I will say, if you have a snake Phobia, whatever the technical term is for that, beware. My husband and my son and my father-in-law all cannot stand snakes. Their reaction when a snake shows up is just unexplainable. They would not have made it through this book. There is a terrifying scene or two, but terrifying that involves snakes and it has scarred me. I mean, I've thought of it probably every day since I put the book down, something comes up and I'm like, oh man, oh you know, I don't have nightmares or anything, but definitely it is a memorable scene and I will remember it for a long time. 
I could see them. I could feel them. Ugh. I could hear them. It's great descriptive writing. This would make a gripping page turning summer read. If you're looking for a thriller, this is it. I do remember that the last time I lied was a really good thr thriller. When I look back, I don't know why. I, I guess because it was, it was an author that I just didn't know who he was at the time. So I read the book and I remembered the book, but I didn't realize that I didn't remember that it was by Riley Sager. But it's another really good thriller and a good summer read. Um, there's a girl who returns to a camp when a tragedy happened when she was there when she was younger. She returns and then it's like history repeats itself. Riley Sager is a pen name. He published his first book in 2017, so it's only been a couple of years here. At least one of his books, Lock Every Door, which I think maybe came out last year, is being turned into a television series. I could definitely see where this is going to be turned into a movie or a television series. You know, even like a Netflix original, definitely could see that happening, and I will be watching it. So Riley Sager writes great thrillers that hold the mystery until the very end. So I highly recommend... Home Before Dark by Riley Sager, and you can see I also wrote a very lengthy review on Goodreads for that. So my recommended drink for you today is called Awake Tea. I make this in the morning, sometimes when I just feel like my coffee did not give me enough of a kick. It has grated ginger and honey and cayenne pepper and cinnamon, am I missing anything? And lemon, and then I just put the Keurig over top of it. Not coffee, just the hot water, you know, just take out the pod and just run hot water and just stir that up. And it just makes a nice little tea in the morning that gives me a little more kick when I don't have enough from my coffee. I'll leave the link for that below. So the other book that I got from NetGalley and reviewed in the last week is by Barbara King Solver. It's called How to Fly in 10,000 Easy Lessons. It's a book of poetry. So again, it's NetGalley, they're eBooks. I don't have the physical ones. So I reviewed that also on Goodreads. I love Barbara Kingsolver. I already recommended to you Bean Trees by Barbara Kingsolver, which I think is probably the first Barbara Kingsolver book that I read. And I'll leave a link below, but I believe I recommended this in the student episode three. I'll check that. And then I also recommended to you Animal Vegetable Miracle, A Year of Food Life by Barbara Kingsolver. I've probably mentioned this in several videos because I reread it every year. I love that book. So whenever I signed up for NetGalley, you put what kinds of books that you are looking for or authors that you're looking for new books for. And I put in Barbara Kingsolver thinking she probably isn't going to have anything out for a while, but I'd like to be on the list. And then this book is coming out. This book of poetry is coming out in December of this year. And it, I already got to read the advanced copy. I haven't read, I know she has another book of poetry and I haven't read that one, but I've read several of her essay books. I've read several of her fiction books and then her nonfiction books. So Bean Trees is definitely my favorite. I love Prodigal Summer. That's a steamy one. Um, Poisonwood Bible is super popular by her. And again, that's a big tome. I mean, that's a, that's a big one and it is dark, but it is so good. It is so worth the read. Homeland and Other Stories. I think Pigs in Heaven is the second one to Bean Trees. Pretty sure it's the sequel. Um, Small Wonder, which is a book of essays, nonfiction essays. I love that book. So I've read a lot of her works, but I would like to go back. She's an author that I would like to pick up anything that I haven't read by her. And this one being poetry, poetry is not really my thing. I did talk to you about Milk and Honey, which is another poetry book that I do really like. And this one is definitely one that I will come back to. I will buy the hard copy when it comes out. I want to have this book so that I can revisit some of these poems. I really loved it. You can read the one of the poems in this book called How to Survive This. It's available on her website. So if you just go to Barbara King Solver's website, it's available there. The other thing that I like about this book of poetry is in the end, she talks about, she dedicates some of these poems. She talks about like where they came from or who she's dedicating them to, or um, she uses a lot of clips from other poems or books or works. And she incorporates those into her poetry and she gives you all those references at the end of the book. It makes for a really interesting read. I loved it. Many of King Solver's signature themes are in here. Environmentalism, parenthood, marriage, gardening, nature. She touches on all those themes. The poems are very short. I would say, I don't even think there's one that, I mean, I'm reading it on an ebook, so it's kind of hard to see, but I would bet that none of them are more than a page long. And they're in different kinds of styles too. Very free verse. So I would highly recommend that poetry book. It does not come out until December, and I'll try and remember when it comes out to push that back out there for you. So that takes me to 34 books read this year, which puts me on par because remember I like to keep about 70 books in the works for the end of the year. 
So pretty much on par for me. And I read 11 books in June, which is super good because I, you know, I try and get at least four books done a month. So getting 11 helps me catch up from where I've fallen behind or maybe even get a step up for where I'm going. We are going into week 28 of the year. So being at 34 puts me at a pretty good place. So in addition to the books that I already read this week and put those reviews out there, I always try and put a book that I have read in the past, especially if I haven't already reviewed it on Goodreads. So some good ones that I put out there this week. Michael Crichton. I have recommended several Michael Crichtons to you. And um, as I was unpacking my books, I came across a couple more. So Michael Crichton's The Andromeda Strain. And I thought this was really cool. In the back, there's a picture of him with the author's information, and it tells you how to pronounce his name. Michael Crichton rhymes with Frighten. I really like that because our book club is reading a Jodi Picoult this um, month, and I always struggle with how to how to say her name. So I like that Crichton rhymes with Frighten. <laughs> this is a timely science fiction read during the coronavirus time. It was written in 1969. It discusses a virus that got out of hand. Crichton shows his signature move for weaving fiction with science fiction, and it's amazing. You will question what is truth and what is not, especially since this was written in 1969. It was made into a film in 1971, and they also did a mini series in 2008, so I'm tracking those down. I highly recommend Michael Crichton's The Andromeda Strain. I already recommended to you Jurassic Park and The Lost World. Those books have been turned into movies and I have watched them I don't even know how many times this year because they are often played on, on the sci-fi channel if you get that or if you go to Spectrum On Demand, sometimes they're available there. I recommended this in episode five of the Student Book Talks or you can watch those movies on Amazon for price. I also read Rising Sun by Michael Crichton but I have not been able to unpack it yet. I unpacked like I can't even tell you how many boxes of books this weekend but I didn't come across Rising Sun so maybe I don't own that one. Even though I talked to you about The Lost World, I only put that recommendation I only put that recommendation out there this week and I forgot, I went back and reviewed flipping through the book and I forgot how different the book is from the movies on this. From what I understand, Michael Crichton wrote Jurassic Park in 1990. It came out into movie theaters in 1993 and Steven Spielberg is the one who produced these. Am I right? Steven Spielberg directed the movies, and after they made the first movie, he, from what I understand, he asked Crichton to write the second book. So he writes it, he writes the second book, but this is not, it's not that similar to the movie. So I don't know if he wrote the book and then also wrote a screenplay, but it really varies from the movie in a good way. Like if you have already read Jurassic Park and you know that you like this, you're gonna like The Lost World, but, but it has more science in it than the story when you were looking at the movie. You know, the movie is very action-packed, very fast moving, and the book has more science in it. It follows different stories, different characters. It's very different. So first there was Jurassic Park, and then there's Site B, two very different places. If you watch the movie, they make that very clear. Jurassic Park 3, whenever Alan gets kidnapped, basically, by those parents that are looking for their lost son, and they're like, you've been here before. And he was like, I've never been here. So whereas Jurassic Park is a page turner, Lost World takes its time talking about the science, but I enjoyed it as much as the first one. Another book that I already talked to you about was Jennifer Cruz's Getting Rid of Bradley, and I unpacked Don't Look Down, so I reviewed that one this week. I have talked to you a little bit about Jennifer Cruz. I enjoy her. This is actually a collaboration with Bob Meyer, who I have never read before. So it makes it more into a thriller kind of romance. So whereas Getting Rid of Bradley is more of a romance, this is more of an adventure thriller with romance thrown in. Lots of humor, definitely that hate to love trope. It's written in third person, which is an interesting perspective when you're talking about romance because you get everybody's story. I read this in April of 2015. I read Getting Rid of Bradley in October of 2017. So they're just really fun chiclet books. I reviewed Getting Rid of Bradley in episode eight for Great Summer Reads. And don't look down, Lucy meets JT. Lucy is usually making dog food commercials, but there's a problem on the set of a movie that's being made and she is hired to come in, clean up the mess and get the movie made. JT is hired to basically help make all the stunts happen. He is a stunt man, but also he's there to make that sort of thing happen. And he thinks, how easy is this gonna be? Because he usually has really tough stuff and all he has to do here is a couple of little things. But little do they know that somebody is interested in shooting more than a movie. This will be a great beach or poolside read. 
Chapter one is on Amazon if you check it out. I'll leave the link below. I talked to you about Flora and Ulysses in episode nine of my Saturday book chats. It's a great Newberry read. I unpacked another one of hers this week. Kate De Camillo's The Tale of Despero. It says from the author of Because of Winn-Dixie, which I also read and I believe was an honor book, but this is an actual Newberry award winner. The Tale of Despero being the story of a mouse, a princess, some soup, and a spool of thread. It's illustrated by Timothy Basil Erring. Kate said that she wrote this book because a friend of her son asked her to write the story of an unlikely hero, and Despero is definitely an unlikely hero. The summary on the Verso page is the adventures of Despero telling a small mouse of unusual talents, the princess that he loves, the servant girl who longs to be a princess, and a devious rat determined to bring them all to ruin. It's classified as a fairy tale. This is the 2003 Newbery Award winner. I would say these are more like intermediate reads. You could definitely play the audio of this or read this to a younger child, but more like intermediate is what Flora and Ulysses or The Tale of Despero, that's probably the age group that's gonna love these the most. Now, again, as always, I didn't read these until I was an adult and I love them. And if you're looking, it is fantasy. You know, it's about the mouse. There is a rat. There, there are all these characters that are in here. But um, I know it's kind of hard to tell as you're looking there, but it takes place in a castle. And when you're looking at some of these illustrations, it just really makes it come to life. They are beautiful. And it's amazing how De Camillo can make this time period seem so relevant for us. It's a book about fate and destiny and about writing your own story. So there are two more Newbery Award winners that I would highly recommend. And then another Newbery that I would like to recommend is Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard Book. And the illustrations are by Dave McKean. So I remember whenever I read The Graveyard Book, I was actually listening to the audio and I had my young son in the car and he is not one for scary stories. And when you are at the opening of this book, the main character, nobody, is it Owens? Yeah, Nobody Owens is in great peril at the beginning of this book, and it's, it's very descriptive. So when you're talking about a Newberry written for kids, especially when we were listening to it and I wasn't reading it ahead of time, I'm like, oh, I don't know if, I don't know if he's going to like this or not. But we did. We, we listened to it together, and we both really enjoyed it. It is not your usual Newberry character. Um, this probably, again, is for upper intermediate to middle school for readers. Um, younger readers can definitely listen or read this and enjoy it, but beware that it is a little creepy. It's one of my favorites, but it's a thriller, supernatural, ghostish story because nobody Owens has been being raised in a graveyard by the um, beings that inhabit it. When something happens to him when he is young, his family is gone and he is going to be raised by these beings that are in the graveyard. And there is someone who is pursuing him relentlessly. Gaiman brings his talent for terrifying tales to a much younger generation. So in the end, nobody must find a way to live outside the confines of the graveyard and to have a future he must face his past. Gaiman is also the author of Coraline, which I will link below. I've been listening to people read that one online. Coraline is an equally spooky kind of book. So let's talk book haul. I think I did a book haul in the last video and that was kind of interesting. Um, I borrowed this one for my sister. This is an Ellen Hilder brand. Ta -da. Summer of 69, definitely very summery, nice little paperback, but I borrowed it from my sister. Haven't read it yet. I'm including it in the book haul, even though I don't actually own it. I picked up this quarterly publication. This is Brie, the Staying Home Special. Um, it's wellness, kindness, mindfulness, and inspiration. They sell it, at, I think I picked it up at Kroger. It'll be in, um, it'll be on display until like middle of August probably, but I'm pretty sure it's a quarterly publication. But I just really enjoy these articles. And last year I wrote, I sent an email to one of these. I know that, I don't know if it was Breathe or I think it was Flow which is a very similar publication, asking them how they got their articles and they said, please submit something. So I just picked it up to kind of remind myself of what it is they're looking for so I can kind of put something together and send it out there. So this particular edition focuses on things that we can do at home while we're in the middle of all this. So there's a stretching, growing plants, building routines, limiting your social media, displaying art, creating art, organizing your home. And then there are puzzles, Sudoku, uh, crosswords, that sort of thing in there. 
and there's some reading recommendations. So I just really enjoy these publications. I have a couple of them. Like I said, the other one that I have that's very similar is called Flow, but I picked that up this week. So I made a, a stop at Goodwill, ran through the book section because I have been looking for these book of the month edition books and score, I found one. This is Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ning. And I've already read it. So, you know, it's one of those things, you know, I like to pick up books that I've already read. I keep the copies of the books that I read. I like to be able to pass them around. And uh, I like to look on the shelf and see those. But I really like these editions of the Book of the Month Club. I'm not part of Book of the Month Club, but a lot of the people that I follow online are, and they're often mentioning these. So this was the September of 2017 pick. It's also one of the picks of the Reese Hello Sunshine Book Club that I talked to you quite a bit about. Remember, they're supposed to be sending me the uh, June and July picks, so I'm still waiting on that. That's been a couple of weeks that they said that they would be sending those in the mail, but it did say, like, we can't guarantee when it's going to make it to you, so I'm anxiously awaiting those two reads, and remember, I still have my name in the hat for being Reese's resident librarian, so still looking forward to that. It's also a good read choice of 2017, so for the whole year, it's like one of the best books of the year. I read it this past December. So super happy that I was able to pick that up. Um, I also picked up Becoming by Michelle Obama. I bought this book for my sister for Christmas and then I never actually read it, but um, it's one of Oprah's uh, 2018 selection for her book club. And obviously you, I'm pretty sure you know about this book and what it's about. So I'm excited. I need to read more memoirs. I enjoy them. And this is one that I've been looking forward to either listening to or reading. I also picked up Ruth Ware's The Turn of the Key. I think that is just a lovely cover and you can see that it's like metallic there. Um, I read Ruth Ware's The Lion Game. She is also the author of The Woman in Cabin 10, which I have not read before, but um, I think I have a copy of that and it's on my reading list too, but super excited about that. I picked all of those up at Goodwill for like nothing, like what, $2 a book or something crazy. So super excited about that book haul. So let's talk book news. There are a couple of things that are out there that I wanted to make you aware of. I've shared them on my Facebook page, so make sure you connect with me there to get lots of book news. But George R. R. Martin, I book talked um, The Game of Thrones in another episode. I'll have to look and see what episode that is and let you know below. But he came out with an article where he is giving us an update on The Winds of Winter Progress. You know, everybody's very anxious for him to finish writing the series because he's an older guy and we need you to finish this series. We don't want somebody picking up your series and writing it. I enjoy the Game of Thrones. It's a beautiful series. I only read the first one. Um, and again, it's a bit of a commitment, but man, it's good, good reading. So The Winds of Winter is the next book in that series. And he is saying that he's making a lot of progress during lockdown on that book. So the new Game of Thrones movie House of the Dragon is tentative, tentatively due out in 2022. It's a prequel. So I'll link that article below, but I always think it's interesting when, they, when authors come out with news about what they've been working on. So make sure you check out my website. Again, I'll link it below, but my read page on my website includes a lot of the book news that we talk about. Another really exciting thing that happened in the past week was Kate Carlisle, the author of my favorite cozy mystery series, Bibliophile. She um, shared my last video where I was reviewing her latest book, The Grim Reader. So that was really exciting. Don't forget at the beginning of every month to check your Amazon Prime membership for free Prime reads. You can pick two books every month. They do have a list of the books that are available to you. And I went back and looked and I don't remember because I, I download free books whenever they come around. So I can't remember which ones were the free ones that I downloaded from the Amazon Prime Reads for July. But take a look at that if you're an Amazon Prime member. They're called First Reads. I usually recommend a podcast to you. I am recommending uh, Rich Roll. His podcasts cover nutrition, health, um, inspiration, meditation, that sort of thing. So I really enjoy his podcast. They are rather long. He usually puts out one a week, but they are rather long. Um, but they're a good one to listen to as I'm going through the day, like just cleaning the house or doing dishes or putting in the laundry. I like to listen to his podcast. Another podcast that I have not listened to in a while, but it's called Call Your Girlfriend. And I just heard today that they are putting out a book. Their book is called Big Friendship. 
how we keep each other close. And I went to the library website to see if I could reserve that. And it says that the audio is actually read by the author. So that's really interesting. It's one of those um, like Seinfeld kind of podcasts where they just talk. It's two friends. I think they're on opposite sides of the continent and they just talk back and forth about whatever, whatever comes to mind. But I used to really enjoy it and I just haven't listened to it in a while just because I'm overloaded with how many great podcasts are out there right now. But I'll revisit that podcast and maybe recommend it again later. But for this week, I do want to recommend Rich Roll's podcast. So that brings me to what am I currently reading? So our book club meets not this Thursday, but next Thursday. And we are reading Jodi Picoult, Small Great Things. And we are also reading Martin Walker's Bruno, Chief of Police. So I have both of those from my public library on um, audio and ebooks. So I will be reading and listening to those for the next week. I've mentioned Jan Karen to you in the past and when I was unpacking, this came up. This is the Mitford Bedside Companion. It's a treasury of favorite Mitford moments, author reflections on the best-selling series, and much, much more. Uh, one of my former students gave this to me like years ago. She knew how much I love the Jan Karen. And there is mm, a really awesome, you know, map in there of the Mitford world. And then again, it's one that I've had by my bedside before we packed everything away. Um, they have excerpts from some of the books, some of your favorite uh, moments from the books, some of the recipes that are in the books. Um, so I just really enjoyed it. And I know that I had talked to you about the Jan Karen series, the Mitford series. It's a cozy series, not mystery, just like a cozy series. Do I have it upside down? Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to mention because I unpacked this, that this is always on my reading list too. It just sits up by my bed. I am still reading House of Leaves. I am not making a lot of progress in this right now. It's a little darker than what I want to read in the summer, to be honest. And again, I've had a lot of deadlines on my NetGalley books. Um, so yeah, I just haven't given it the time that it needs. Two books that when I was unpacking, I set aside to go over for my curriculum this year. And that is The World's Great Letters. This is such a beautiful book. I was so excited whenever I unpacked it. And this is why it takes me forever to unpack things. But the world's greatest letters, it's a treasury, from ancient days to our own time, containing the characteristic and crucial communications, intimate exchanges, and cycles of correspondence of many of the outstanding figures of world history, some notable contemporaries, selected, edited, integrated with biographical backgrounds and historical settings and consequences. And it is copyright 1940. So yes, I'm aware that it is very old, but my gosh, there are some awesome things in here. And we've been talking about this and look at this has like little quotes that are talking to you about the importance of letters. And then in the table of contents, like some of them are very ancient, like Alexander the Great and King Darius exchanged defiance for the mastery of the world. But one that really, two up, um, that really caught my attention, Leonardo da Vinci asks the Duke of Milan for a job. Charles Dickens tells his wife that their infant daughter has died. Ah, there are things like the letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. P.T. Barnum offers General Ulysses S. Grant a job. So just some really cool letters. I had already written that I wanted to talk a little bit about the form of letters in my curriculum this year. So I just thought this might be some interesting ones that even though they're old, that might interest the kids as well as me. Another one that I unpacked that I think I will be using this year, so I pulled it to read some of it, is uh, Types of Great Literature. This is copyright 1919. I forgot I had these great books, <laughs> pun intended. It has excerpts from some of these types of literature, epic and romance, narrative poetry, the ballad, lyric poetry, history, biography, letters, orations, and essays. And then it has some of the famous examples um, of our literature, of those types of literature. So I thought that was really cool. Um, I've been gathering again, the poems that I want to highlight or the different types of literature that I want to highlight. And so again, I pulled this because I think it's really gonna be useful this year. I am well aware that I am teaching in 2020, <laughs> but I am also an old school teacher. So I do already have another book from NetGalley that I need to review. Actually, there are two and they are the Cozy Case Files, A Cozy Mystery, Volumes 8 and 9. So it looks like this. It, it, it has stories in here by Donna Andrews, Ellie Alexander, Allison Montclair, Carolyn Haynes, Leonard Goldberg, Kylie Logan, Susanna Calkins, Eve Calder, and Hannah Dennison. And this is in the Volume 9 one. And Ellie Alexander is definitely a cozy mystery writer that I have read before. 
And here's the other one. It looks more like a Christmassy one, but it is a Cozy Mystery Sampler Volume 8. Uh, Vivian Chen, Diane Kelly, Elizabeth Penny, Paige Shelton, and MC Benton. So short stories. I'm excited about both of these. Uh, when I went back into NetGalley, both of these came up when I typed in Cozy Mysteries. So we'll see. You know how much I love Cozy Mysteries. I was probably halfway, a little more than halfway through um, McManus, One of Us is Lying on Audio. I love it. It's very reminiscent of 13 Reasons Why. It has definitely kept my attention, but I just didn't have enough um, audio time moments this um, past week to get it finished. Uh, my family was around a lot, so I don't usually listen to audiobooks while they're actually here. It automatically returned to the library, so I had to go back and put a hold on that. So I look forward to finishing that later. I also started reading Christina Lauren's The Unhoneymooners, but again, it was an ebook, and because I had other things that were on my plate, I didn't get to it in time. So got um, several chapters into that, and then it automatically returned. So I'm back on the holds list for that. I'm still waiting for the beach read and what's the other one? The beach read and the beach house, I think. Still waiting for both of those. Oh, the other really cool thing about this, the world of letters is that there are actual copies of some of the letters in, the, in their handwriting, which is really cool. So here's Aaron Bird at Alexander Hamilton. Now, obviously they had to retype it for us, but it's just really cool that those illustrations are in there. I'm linking below some of the other ones that I have continuously talked about. I haven't made my whole way through, but JK Rowling's The Ichbog, um, James and the Giant Peach Re being read aloud, Harry Potter being read aloud. All of those links will be down below. I did want to point out my bookmark that has been in here. I think it's been in a couple of videos, but it's um, my, my one little word of the year is trust. Um, so my sister gave me this for my birthday and I just love it. And I'll leave the link below on Etsy. Is it Maxine Leanne? I think I'll link it below, but I order stuff from her all the time. And that's where this bookmark came from. And I just love it. There is a free link to a book on Amazon on my Facebook page. I didn't want to put it in the video because they only last for like 24 hours or something like that. But if you follow me on Facebook, I always try and push those out to you. If I see that there is a book that is a free download on Amazon for your Kindle, I'll throw it out there. Another great article on my Facebook page in the last week is one um, from Book Riot, 20 Must Read YA Rom-Coms for 2020. So you might want to check that out. I don't think I had any new coffee shop stops this week. Can that be true? <laughs> I think it's getting ready to rain out here. So I'm going to have to wrap this up pretty quick. Ah, I always like to talk to you about those books being made to movies. So I've already talked to you about Hunger Games. I talked to you about um, Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park, Lost World, that whole thing. But a couple more that I came across this week. Um, I've been watching Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency on BritBox. If you get BritBox, that's been fun. Just kind of came across that one. It's quirky. It's very like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy weird, but I really enjoy them, especially they're very British. Another one that we watched this week, uh, it's Clive Cussler's character, Dirk Pitt, and that's Sahara. We watched it off of Amazon Prime. So if you're an Amazon Prime member, it was fun. It was good. Now, obviously I have a little bit more um, love for Dirk pit because I've read the Clive Cussler books and I haven't done a book chat on those but I haven't unpacked those yet either but he's an adventure guys he's a guy's guy I enjoyed the movie and so did John as always I'm happy to be your friendly librarian all the books that I review on these videos are on my goodreads and I always push those onto my Facebook Remember, you can easily get access to these books from your public library with a public library card, which is easy to get online. But when this is all over, it's also a good idea to stop by your local public library and get to know the people that are there. Even if they don't have the physical books, if you talk to them, most of the times they can get those for you. I like to get eBooks and audiobooks from my public library for free and push those onto my phone or my Kindle. Let's be friends. Follow me on Facebook, Goodreads, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter. Check out my website and be sure to watch all my YouTube videos. Hit the subscribe and like button so that you know when a new video comes out. Comment, email, message, text. Just talk to me. Let me know what you like that we talked about, what you're reading, what you plan to read, or even if you're looking for something specific. Keep in touch. Enjoy.